Hey guys, Jeff from Home Renovision here, and today we've got an A to Z video for you. This is my crash course beginner's guide to doing any kind of renovating. Now, the reason I'm calling it a crash course is it covers so much important information. Listen, if you're gonna do flooring project this year, or you're going to be doing any kind of like uh, changing of your mechanical, plumbing, bathrooms, all that kind of stuff, you've gotta have this information. You cannot renovate with new materials in an older home without watching this video you're gonna not be successful. Warning, there's a lot of work to do before you can go out and buy yourself a $2 a square foot floor and stick it in your house. And in this video, we're covering all the information so that you don't have a catastrophe on your hands. I don't wanna see you invest money in good materials and have a failure, so make sure you're in this. Give this a thumbs up if you're glad that I'm saving your bacon here, because no one out there is gonna tell you all the work that needs to go into your project before you start installing your vinyl flooring, before you change something out. If you've got old dimensional floor joists like in this picture, the only flooring you can install is carpet, sheet vinyl, or hardwood. And guess what? No one's doing that anymore. That means that whatever flooring you're buying, if you have an older house, you're not ready to install it yet. Watch the video, we'll see you on the other side. Put all your questions and comments in the comments section because we are here to help. I read them every day and I'm gonna answer your questions. All right, let's just jump into this and I'll see you at the other side of this long video that's gonna answer every question you've ever had about your floor. Amazing how just a little bit of movement causes such an irritating sound. In today's video, we're gonna show you how to get rid of your floor squeaks once and for all and how they started in the first place. All right, so first thing you do when you see a squeak, everyone likes to find, oh, there's that nail that needs to be embedded. There, problem solved, right? Now watch what happens. As soon as you get up, oh, how come the nail doesn't stay down? I'm gonna help you understand your floors, how your house is built, so you know what to do to stop this from reoccurring over and over and over again. Because if you wanna install a new floor and you can't stop your squeaks, you got no business moving forward. Let's get this started. Okay guys, so when we're talking about squeaky floors, generally what we're doing is we're talking about flooring. Um, I'm gonna say pre-1990. And I think 1990 is around the time period. I don't quote me on the exact date. It wasn't like June 3rd or something, but in the 90s, we started to change the technique for installing subfloor on our floor joists. Now, there were, let's say from um, the mid to late 1800s up until about 1990, very similar floor joist packages in the world. And it was kind of a standard. We used to use a two by 10, okay? And the, in the older stuff, it, was, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't planed down to be exactly nine and a quarter by uh, one and a half, okay? It was actually two inch by 10 inch. It was rough sawn lumber. And they used to use that as a floor joist. And then they would have plank flooring, usually uh, like a three quarter or one inch solid pine, depending on the region, right? They'd use the wood in the region. And they would tongue and groove and put that in. And they would always nail it together. And generally speaking, old growth forest, which is what they were using back in the old days, it stayed really strong and really straight, okay? There's not a lot of problems with old growth trees as a rule. Uh, there's always gonna be a certain percentage of, well, that knot was just on the wrong space for what that floor was trying to carry. And, you know, so situations will happen. But as a rule, we'll call old growth was a lot stronger and a lot straighter, okay? The more you go through time, in through the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, especially the 40s, 50s, and 60s, if your house was built then, they were experimenting like mad. So the standard today is two by 10 with a 5 8 OSB subfloor. Back in the 50s and 60s, and even into the 70s, they were still experimenting with half inch subfloor, trying to get away with it. They were widening out the floor joist cavities, going to 40, oh sorry, <laughs> 40 inch, man, that'd be interesting. They were going to 24 and 30, 32s. I mean, it was crazy what they were trying to get away with, but they were constantly experimenting. And then the building code started to get a little more serious about how we did things, okay? Nowadays, we've got this going on. Now, back in the old days, they used to nail everything together. So you'd have this nailing situation where they just caught the edge of the board. You know, things are imperfect. And then they started using nomadic nailers, the automatic. And because it was automatic, they were moving so fast. I mean, I've been in floor in basements before, looked up at the ceiling and seen nothing but missed nails. I mean, it was really brutal. 
The faster you go, the less attention to detail, so the more at risk you are of having issues like that. When it just misses, it's not catching. And if it's not nailed properly, it's not helping to transfer load when you walk, okay? Now, somewhere along the way in technology, we move from nails to screws, and that is much better, and that's actually pretty recent. Up until recent days, everybody was running around with a pneumatic air nailer, just pounding nails all over the place. And here's what happens. When you step in the middle of the wood, okay, you get what's called deflection. And that means the weight is going down, and then here, where it hits that piece of wood, is being pushed up. Okay, so I'm gonna just step on this right now, and I'm gonna let you take a look at the difference. No weight, okay? You see the movement in the floor? I'm not jumping up and down. I'm no grand piano, but do you hear the squeak? That squeak is actually caused by the sound of the wood, right? Rubbing up and down on the nails, okay? Doesn't matter how many times you pound that in. Over time, as you're walking, deflection We'll lift that out really easily, okay? So for everybody in the renovation market who's looking at new flooring, the first thing you've got to do before you think about new flooring is fixing your subfloor if you have an older house. Now, if you have dimensional lumber, see this? You're going to get weird shapes. You're going to get bows and you're going to get curves. You're going to get all kinds of action. And what happens is that you'll put in your joist nice and straight and then over time it goes bowed. Now every one of those nails is still set at the same depth and the plywood is moving underneath your feet when you're walking. That's where the noise is coming from. So before you move forward and put in a new floating floor or you change your or add hardwood, you've got to deal with the subfloor issue. So in this video, I'm going to teach you guys how to get rid of the creaks and it's this simple. Now where I live in Canada, we have something called a floor screw. And I've heard in the comments before that you don't have that down in the States. I don't know, I haven't been to the hardware store to confirm that, but if anybody knows for sure, could you put in the comment section? Maybe you just have a different name or there's a, um, a brand out there that's cornered the market that I'm not aware of. Anyway, flooring screws are really awesome. You just come along here and you drive that in. Now here's the difference. It doesn't change the deflection, but what it does, is it gets rid of the ability for the subfloor to disengage from your dimensional lumber. And if it holds everything tight, then you're not gonna get the rubbing on the screw, on the nails, you're gonna get rid of your squeaks. So, if you've got squeaks, and you're not gonna open up your floor and rebuild the whole package, okay? I'm just talking about if you're gonna be changing your flooring and you've got squeaks, go buy a box of flooring screws, okay? And go and add a screw everywhere that there's a nail. Now, Along the floor joist package, subfloor has to have a, a nail every eight inches. You can change that with a screw every eight inches. You just set it beside it. You know which way the, the floor joist is running because the nail's every eight. In the opposite direction, they're every 16, okay? And that's all you need to know. So you can just put a fastener next to the old fasteners, drive those nails down or pull them out for all that matters because they're useless and you will eliminate all the squeaks in your floors as well. Oh, give this video a thumbs up if that is gonna save your bacon. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel because we didn't do this mock-up just to show you about a squeaky floor. I'm gonna be cutting out the subfloor and showing you how to open it up, drill holes, run plumbing, repair your subfloor, close it back up again, and bring up your subfloor standard to such an incredible level that you can install new building materials on old floors. Listen, this is really key, okay? Older houses with dimensional lumber are not designed to have modern materials installed in them. Think about this for a second. <sighs> Old materials were skinny. Heck, even the, even the hardwood was only two and a quarter inches wide. So it could follow all the curves and all the imperfections, okay? The more modern the material, the wider the plank. Hardwood, engineer hardwood now is 12, 16 inches wide, okay? Tiles are getting massive. All of this is because we've gone from dimensional lumber to engineered truss. Engineered truss stay perfectly flat. They don't need help leveling, okay? And as a result, people with more modern construction homes are allowed to brag about it in the design choices they make with bigger flooring. 
Now, if you've got an older house and you want to move to bigger flooring, you can, but you're going to have to watch the next few videos because I'm going to show you how to open up your subfloor and level everything off and double up the strength so that you can put in brand new massive tiles or huge engineered hardwood and not run into problems and have a gorgeous home. Hey guys, Jeff from Home Renovision here today. Today I got a mock-up here of a subfloor system for a traditional home with 2x10 framing. And what we're going to do is we're going to show you guys how to open up the subfloor so that you can level your subfloor or do plumbing or change mechanical or find hidden electrical junction boxes in the ceiling from the floor down beneath. And we're going to show you how to do that and then how to restore it, how to put it all back together again. Because it's one of the most important aspects of your house is your subfloor. And if you have dimensional lumber floor joists, you're going to need to be able to open this up at some point to fix the bows and the humps and have access to run your plumbing and your bathrooms. And I want to make sure that you know how to open it and close it properly so that you don't have weak spots in your floor that'll wreck your finished flooring down the road. All right, so here we go. Let me just show you this. We did a mock-up. We intentionally made this unlevel, okay? So traditionally, there's uh, two kinds of subfloor out there. If your house is older, your subfloor isn't going to have lines on it, okay? But if it's newer, it will. And these lines are designed to be 16 inch on center and these extra lines are for eight inches, okay? Because some houses have every 16 inches, all right? And some are every 24. So the sub sheet of subfloor is kind of like a tape measure. The first line is a 16 inch and the same gap, okay? So this is your typical 16 inch flooring, all right? Watch this. If you look at your subfloor and your nails are on this line here, and then here, and then here, you know you have a 24 inch floor joist space, because that's what they represent. So this is every 24 inches, all right? Typically, the floor joists run in the same direction as these lines, because the, the subfloor, which is a four by eight foot sheet, should be contrary to the direction of the floor joists. So when you're looking at your, your floor, after you pull up your carpet, let's say, you'll see all your sheets are in one way, they're staggering the joints, and you can pretty be comfortable that the floor joists are running in the same direction as the lines, or contrary to the length of the sheet. So. The length of the sheet is like this. You can expect your floor joist package to be like this. Now, unfortunately, I don't have enough space in my bedroom here to be able to set the whole floor up for you like that. So I cheated and I put the floor joist the other direction just for the purpose of showing you how to open and close. Don't be confused by the demonstration. Your floor joists usually run perpendicular to the length of the subfloor panel. All right. When you're going to go cut your subfloor, if your house is older, it's going to be nailed down. If you see nails, you know there isn't any glue underneath there. It was very uncommon for anybody to use any kind of glue or adhesive or anything with a nail package as well, okay? So nine times out of ten, you're not going to run into any issue. You just cut it and lift it and walk away. And that means if you cut it properly, you can reinstall the same sheet of plywood or OSB. If you cut it properly, you can reinstall the same piece of OSB back in the original position we're going to show you how to do that. If it has been glued down and it's a more modern construction, the chances that that OSB are going to get removed and still be structurally sound are zero. So <laughs> what you would do in that case is the following. Okay. If you're going to be cutting your subfloor out just to get access to run plumbing or to open up a specific spot that you know is a problem, you can buy a piece of plywood in the same thickness as the floor. It's either half inch or five eighths, depending on the age of the home. Okay, and what you do is you buy this panel. You don't have to buy a whole four by eight foot sheet. You can buy just enough to get you your access. And you lay it down, okay? And then you can just trace it out. And then cut that line, okay? So then you can pull out the old, because when you're done, you're gonna need to also chisel off the glue, right? And the remnants of the other OSB. Then when you're finished, you have the right size piece to go back and top. You don't want to try to measure out a two by four foot piece. Just buy it first and set it down and trace it. It'll save you a ton of time. Another simple option if you're opening it up is to actually cut out the whole four foot width. Okay? And then just cut down the sides. All right? That's easy as well because then when you go to reinstate the plywood, it's really not that tricky. It's just tongue and groove. And what you would do is you would just cut the bottom part of the groove off. So you can stick in the tongue and set it in place and screw it down. Hopefully that made sense. All right. Now, when it comes time to actually do the cutting, you're going to want to take your saw 
always take the battery out of your tools before you mess around with them, okay? And you're going to want to set the depth of your saw to that of the material plus a hair. Now I have 5 8 subfloor, so I'm going to set my depth to just under 3 quarters. And the reason I'm doing that is because when you're dealing with the humps, and this is flat, you're going to have high and low spots that the saw is going to miss. So it's better to cut just a little bit more so you always get right through, okay? And then you only have to do it once. Now, the easiest way to cut, of course, is to use your wall as a guide, and you can cut right up against the fence. So you can set this here, put the fence against the 2x4, and you can just run it along the edge. And when you're working with OSB, wear some safety protection, okay? This chipboard flies all over the place. And I'll demonstrate how to open this up now. Okay, nice and easy. Now, I'm going to open up another big piece of the floor here because um, we're going to get it nice and exposed so we can talk about other issues that are going on. Ah, I'll check this out. Now when you're cutting, take a look here, we've got a nail line, okay? You don't want to cut through the nails. So come up a little bit shy of that, and put your edge of your table on that, on your nail line. Right? Piece of cake so far. <laughs> because this is just a mock-up and a demonstration, I have a little bit of flexibility. I'm going to move my wall over here now and show you the difference on the two kinds of joist cavities. All right, let's do this real quick. Ah. Now, we've all seen the cartoons, you know, when they, they cut the hole in the floor and then the floor falls out. <laughs> It doesn't happen in real life because we, in the cartoons they don't have floor joists, right? So it's okay to sit in the middle of the product that you're cutting as long as you're wise enough to be putting your weight in between two floor joists. If it's just on one side, you might cause it all flip and fall through the ceiling. I guess that's always a possibility, eh? Here we go again. We'll just line up the table up against the wall. Okay, now you'll see back here, because I was close here and then I turned this way, the saw cut didn't get all the way through. Okay, so you're probably going to need a second tool, like a reciprocator or a chisel, to be able to make that cut. All right, let me go demonstrate that. Hello, me likey. All right. Now, remember, the danger with this tool we don't know what's underneath the floor. Okay, so you can't just shove this thing all the way in and then start cutting, all right? So you wanna use just the tip, okay? So reach out, line it up. It's gonna make a bit of a mess, and that's okay. Everything's disengaged. Uh, almost, I think. Stopped short of them over here, didn't I? There we go. Ah. Okay. We have some movement here now, obviously, but it's still all nailed down down the middle. So you can see that floor joist has obviously got a bad bow in it because of how much this sank. And now we got to try to get all this out of here. Now we got options. If you're planning on using the OSB again, you don't want to just start hacking away at this to get this underneath, okay? Um, if you have a second hammer, you could use that as a pry bar. The other option get a little lever going there, okay? Pull your nail, all right? And then when you're rocking it up, 
put your thumb over the head because you don't want to have it coming flying up into your eyeball. Okay, because you're working right over top where you are. Again, just a little lever. Remember these nails, they're designed to work with gravity. Okay, there's really not much going on, which is why these floors squeak so easy. Okay, there we go. That demonstration is over. And you can shove your screwdriver in there. Ah, get off the plywood, obviously, now. Okay. Mm hmm. Okay. Amazing what a drill bit can do, eh? Get your hammer under there as a lever. And you can start working your way around the hole. Usually they don't fight too much. Now, in the real world, I'd be standing on the ceiling drywall. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> you go right through, okay? All right, now let's move this to the side. We'll talk about our subfloor. Ah, okay. So here we are, now we've got our hole. You, last thing you want to do is just make sure your corners are clean, nothing's obstructed, like this corner here is dirty. I don't want to try to put a new piece of plywood in here later, so I'll clean up all the junk. Make sure there's no nail heads or screw heads sticking in the wood. Okay, then you got a nice clean hole. Now you can do whatever you want to do. Now, you can see the problem here. If I just put the subfloor back right now, all right, and honestly, big mistake would be to install it with the same fasteners in the same location. Clean all this out. A, we're not going to install the subfloor back with nails. We're going to use screws the second time. So these are just in the way, okay? So now you got a clean piece of subfloor. Oh. If I lay it back in the same position, and I know it fits, because it came out of that hole. Look, I have no structural integrity anymore. Okay, you see that deflection? We have to now brace all this up. All right, so that we can reinstate. And, and this is the biggest question. People are always asking me, how do I create strength there now? Because <laughs> that's not what you're looking for. Okay. Uh, if you're working, there's a few things that we need. Uh, one, we don't need blocking from here to here, okay? The OSB is designed to transfer load 16 inch on center, so you're fine. But what you do need is where this overhangs, this area here. You need, you need something to support that corner and that corner, all right? And then you need something every 16 inches from here down this way. And the only way to add blocking support here is to go from frame to frame. Now just a note. When you're working in this area, feel free to put a block across. All right? <laughs> Be a little safer. But watch this. I've seen this done a thousand times. Guys will put a two by four like this and they'll just screw it to the subfloor. All right? I'm telling you right now, that's not a good plan. There's not enough transfer of that load from using screws, okay, to, to do that seam. And that's going to be a weak spot in the floor forever. You've got to get underneath, right to the other side, measure and cut here, and install this board here every 16 inches. And we're gonna show you how to do that right now. All right, well now it's time to close, but before we close up, I'm gonna just suggest that you like this video if you're learning things and subscribe to the channel. You might notice we've been drilling some holes and other things and laminating some boards and we've been doing a whole four or five part series on what to do once you've opened your floor, the repairs you can make, how to run your plumbing, run your electrical. All of this stuff is in the next few videos, so make sure you hit the bell for notifications and stay with us through this whole program. We're gonna teach you everything you need to know about opening your floor and what to do once you're in there. Now, one thing you've gotta do before you close up, grab a broom, all right, and a vacuum. Sweep out the cavities, get all the debris out once you're done making your mess, 
because the last thing you want to do is have it set up so one day down the road some other poor sucker opens up the ceiling and has all of your crap landing on their face right let's just be kind to each other all right so good little sweep goes a long way doesn't hurt to make sure that all the cavities are nicely cleaned out Now that we're ready to close up, let's just go through the structural elements here. OSB that travels from 16 inch to 16 inch is strong. It's just as strong as anywhere else on the floor. So don't even concern. You don't have to block up every part where you cut out. You only have to block up where you have the corners. And then every 16 inches after that, all right? So before we block, we make sure we put screws everywhere where our joist cavity is gonna be attached. And if you see a nail sticking out, hammer it down. Ah, this will make it easier down the road to connect the dots and know where your screw joist line is. Next, we're going to take our tape measure, go underneath the subfloor until we hit a floor joist and take the measurement. It's 14 and a quarter. Okay, now this is my 14 and a quarter, and it just barely makes it. Ah. Now the secret to installing blocking for subfloor is this. It doesn't have to be able to carry a thousand pounds, just about a hundred, all right? Now, each screw that we're working with carries 80 pounds shear strength. It's 160 on each end, so it's more than sufficient. But just to make sure we get extra bond, we're gonna fill up both ends with the PL Premium and set it in place. So you wanna prep your block before you install it. Now, here's how we're gonna do that. When I set this in, I can't put it in place. Here's the edge that's causing me issue. Set it on top of the joist. And bevel your edge. Okay? That's all it takes. Now, I can set it in there with my hands. Don't even need a hammer. Okay? So now we know it fits. And we know I'm going in this as the top. I need to set, start my screws. This is gonna be important. Okay, because what we're going to end up doing is reaching underneath that with our screwdriver, grabbing that screw and driving it home once we've got it set in place. So you want to have them all set up first. It's really hard to do that from scratch once you're underneath. Now we've got the block ready to roll. And there's two other things here. We're going to set up screw there, and a screw here, and I'll show you the process. So now we're going to glue up the end, nice and healthy bead, okay? We're going to reach underneath, go half and half, lift it up nice and tight. Now, now it's nice and tight, we'll set the first two screws on top. And that will pull it tight to the subfloor and make sure that it's in the right position to transfer the load. And then we'll reach underneath and we'll screw the rest. Now, depending on the speed you're working, if you have glue squeezing out, you know, feel free to wipe that down. Okay, don't want that in the way. We're gonna do that one, two, right? Every 16, three, and then four. And we do four of these blocks, then we can pretty much be comfortable that we're not gonna have any soft spots on the floor. All right, so now we are ready to go. I'm gonna just walk through this real quickly. I've got my blocks and you can see they're on the flat. One of the reasons for that is, in a lot of cases when you're closing up a floor again, you're gonna have electrical and plumbing that is more than an inch and a half away from the surface, and you'll need to put your blocks on the flat in order to clear them, okay? I'm doing to demonstrate that this is an acceptable practice, all right? The strength that's in this block on the, on the flat like this is greater than the strength of OSB traversing the same distance, okay? So yes, it would be stronger if it was rolled the other way, but if you put them every 16 inches, you're actually increasing the strength of the floor versus just regular OSB. So there's no need to go the extra mile if you don't need to. 
Now when you're putting all this back, you've got glue everywhere, that's great. You've already opened up a construction adhesive tube. Might I suggest that you run a bead down the floor joist and then even on these areas here. This is just a little overkill, but sometimes, especially with structure, a little overkill. It isn't really overkill, it's normal, all right? That way you're laying the plywood into an adhesive and you're guaranteed a great bond. And if you're doing a larger space and you want to take a look at an option, you can always take out your foam gun. These foam guns also come with a polyurethane foam construction adhesive. This is a different product in the same sort of can, okay? So we're going to show you the difference right here. Here's the old stuff. And the new stuff is a little darker yellow. The same way we apply window and door foam, you can use subfloor adhesive. See how it expands? Okay. Nice and simple. One of these cans will do most of the five or six hundred square feet of flooring. It's super quick. Ta-da! I would suggest, as a good practice, if you're going to be bracing up your floor, put all your bracing in and then wait till the next day before you put the subfloor on and walk on it again. Give that adhesive time to set up. That really is the strongest part of the whole mess. And everywhere you see a screw on the outside perimeter, you know there's a floor joist there. You also know in every corner you've put blocking. All right. And this is really, really easy to set up. Now remember, we also used a surface screw to set the block and pull it tight so you can stitch the corner. There's always gonna be a screw right across from the other one. All right? So even though there's no floor joists here, there's something to screw into and pull it tight. This is the beautiful part about this system. By using surface screws to set the block, you automatically identify where the wood location is. And then you just run it along. Uh, preferably every eight inches on center. That's 16, that's eight. That's 16, that's eight. You can change your plumbing. You can change your electrical. You can fix your squeaks. You can set yourself up with a subfloor now that has the capacity for large format tile with Ditra because you've screwed it and glued it. All right, you never have to worry again about whether or not your flooring installation is going to hold. And that is half the job on a job. Honestly, half the work on any project is preparation. So opening your floors, opening your walls, doing all the rough ends, getting it all closed up, ready for finishing is half the job. Now you know how to do the first half of a job. We've got all kinds of other videos that'll show you how to do the second half of the job. Now remember, if you guys know how to prep your work, open your floors, move your mechanical and electrical, get them closed up again, make it stronger than it ever was before. If you can take an old home with dimensional lumber and create a, a surface that's just as good as anything that's brand new and engineered flooring, then you can put any kind of flooring you want in your house. Back to the next part of our series of my mock-up of the floor. Um, in video number one, we talked about how to cut a hole in your subfloor so that you can get access to all your problems and fix them. Today, we're talking about one of the most commonly asked questions I get is how do I fix my floor joists? Let's just be honest. If you have an older house and you have dimensional lumber, you're gonna have issues, kind of like this, right? There's just no level here. I got one that's humped and I got one that's bowed right next to each other. It's a very dramatic illustration of the kind of problems you can run into. Most people only have one or two of these problems in an entire room, and so you can't ignore it and move on and put in flooring, okay? You're gonna have issues. Whenever you have a hump in the floor, you're asking your flooring to stretch, and it's not gonna happen. You've gotta get it flat. Your floor doesn't have to be level, but it sure has to be flat, because the tongue and groove joints that are in most of the flooring that you're installing will not stretch and add capacity to go over humps and then fill valleys. So that you have to do that before you put the floor down, all right? Now, in some situations, you can fill a valley 
If you have a floor leveler, that works great. We've got a video on that. We'll put that link in the description below. Now, floor leveler works if your subfloor is glued and screwed, all right? But if you have subfloor that's installed with just nails, and you can tell because a nail looks like a nail, you can nail that down all you like. And over time, as you walk, the head of that nail is gonna pop back up again. So if you put floor leveler to fill a gap with a nailed down subfloor, it's not a strong enough structure to do that, and it's gonna fail. I'm telling you right now, don't invest your money in a bag of floor leveler. It's $50 for the wrong reason. Cut a hole in your floor, and I'll show you how to fix it the right way, and you won't have this problem ever again. And it'll only cost you five or six bucks. <laughs> ah, so without wasting any more time in talking about floor packages, let's just open up this hole. It should be easy enough to do. I just cut this yesterday. Here we go. Now, if you missed the video where we showed you how to cut this out, so you can do it safe and smart and then reinstall it again, you should check out the link in the video description. We'll put that there as well. It's part one of the series and it'll save your bacon. Now, when I went to Home Depot to build this mock-up, I expected to find two by tens that were warped and bowed. And I was gonna build this cute little package with bad wood. <laughs> You won't believe it. Every piece of wood that was available for sale was perfect. <laughs> I don't know how I got so lucky. Um, so what I did is I, I built this incorrectly. So you're gonna have to bear with me a little bit. For the demonstration purposes, I installed them at different heights, just so that we can get this straight. I'll show you how to fix all this. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna assume, for the purpose of our demonstration, that this one is bowed, okay? And the way that we fix a bowed floor is really simple. We simply go like this with our level, all right? And we measure down what our gap is as we move across the board. I can make my mark on the side based on that gap, okay? And I can trace it like that, all right? And then I can draw a line and I can go like that because it'll be something like that. That's pretty dramatic, but you get the idea. Or the other way to do it is you take a straight edge, you put it in your floor cavity, okay? and you lift it up tight, and you scribe it, all right? Now, if the wood has a warp, it'll scribe really nicely, and you cut that off. In our case, of course, the wood is perfect, so it defeats my purpose for this video, but I'm gonna show you how to plane down your floor anyway. Now, yes, I know, it's not a DeWalt planer, but the truth is, is I've had this thing for years, these tools just, if you take care of them, they last forever. And I'm not replacing it unless DeWalt gives me a free one <laughs> or it dies and I need to buy another one. And even that plug has survived all these years. It's amazing. Now, the way this works is this is a depth setter. It has different dimensions on it. Uh, 1 32nd of an inch, so on and so on. Um, it gets pretty aggressive. You know, you can go up to 3 32nds of an inch, which is almost 10% of an inch, guys. I mean, it's pretty impressive, right? This is the discharge port where the material comes flying out. So make sure when you're planing, you're not sitting here like this watching your line, okay? If your line is over here and you gotta keep an eye on it, position your body so that you can watch what you're doing and discharge the material away from your face, all right? For purposes of demonstration, I'm gonna plane it this way. We'll show you how this tool works. Basically, it's a round disc, okay? And it spins incredibly fast and there's a whole blade there. And because we're adjusting this, it sets the depth of the front plate and the back plate at different heights. And when you go the other way, you can see the gap, right? So when you put this on the wood, the back end, once you start cutting, it drops as low as the front. And you'll, you'll see how dramatic this is. I don't wanna cut that dramatic though, because I wanna be able to show a nice, Flat subfloor later. There, let's go to that, that's good. Okay, here we go, demonstration, how a planer works. You put the point in the middle of your material, okay? And there's this little safety heel back here. Once that's down, you know you've made engagement with the wood and it's cutting right underneath your hand, right here. All right, so here we go. Safety switch is on and then we power up the tool. And that's a very mild plane, okay? And if you got more work to do, you can go more aggressive. <laughs> Wrong way. There we 
There we go. <laughs> And you can take off as much material as you need. Sometimes it's easier to start on the top of the hump. All right? And you can see, you can make real quick work of this adjustment, all right? Now, that's how you deal with it if it's a hump, okay? No, there are no other options. <laughs> if you want to get rid of a hump and you don't have a planer, you could use a belt sander or a orbital sander but you're going to go with like a 50 or a 36 grit and you're going to be prepared to invest about an hour you can get it done okay so don't worry about that let me just disengage this before somebody gets hurt real bad all right now whoo this is not as common as the other one most of the time when we're installing flooring we're building a house back in the day dimensional lumber we intentionally put the crown of the wood to the top. And that means the wood has a bit of an arc to it. Every wood has just a little bit. And we put that to the top so that when we're done building, all the weight of the construction flattens it out. Okay, dimensional lumber has that kind of flexibility in it. If you put the crown upside down, you make a bowl. And the same thing happens. You put all that weight on it and it gets even more pronounced. So having deep valleys are really common. And the deep valleys cause an issue because they create squeaks. Because what happens is, well, I'm not going to go into it all right now. Click the link up here or check out the video description. We did a video on how to fix squeaks, and I explained that all in there. I'm not going to do it twice. Check that one out. It's a quick little video. You'll love it. All right. So now we've got this situation where we want to fix the bow. Okay? First thing we do is lift up your subfloor at the edge. Okay? Make life easy for yourself. Look at the gap here. Once you lift up the subfloor, you can put the level across it. All right, and now we can get that flat. And you can decide if the gap is big enough of an issue. If there's still too much of a gap, you might want to cut even more subfloor out until it gets back to level. And in a lot of cases, you're going to be right up near the end of the floor, okay? Because it's set at the same height at each end and it dips in the middle. So don't be afraid to keep open your floor until you find your subfloors making contact with your floor joists. All right, very important. And then I've got two different ways that you can fix this. So we're gonna go through them both right now. One thing I should mention, uh, when you're planing down a hump, you are affecting the dimension of the lumber and making it smaller, which means it's no longer rated to carry the load that it's designed to carry. So depending on the kind of flooring that you're gonna go finish with, you might want to take the next step in this repair and beef up the strength of that beam. And that is by doing this, a laminating process, okay? Where you actually use construction adhesive and some screws, you tie it all together. Adds more strength to that board to replace the strength. This is gonna be necessary if you're doing a tile job here, okay? Definitely, you have to do that. You won't get away with it otherwise. Now, the next kind of damage we're going to deal with is when you have the bow. Obviously, we've got issues there, so let's get into that. So now what we're going to do is I'll show you my technique when you're doing this and working alone. You want to take a flooring screw right off the edge of the OSB, about an inch back, okay? And just get the screw started so it's in place. All right? Now you take a 2 by 4 that bridges that gap, okay? And you screw it to the OSB on both sides. There we go. Now you got two options here to take a look at how to fix this big divot. And we're just gonna draw it out on that board so you can see it real easy. Okay? That's getting up to almost a quarter inch, which is significant. You've got two options. If we were to do this the old school way because Depending on, again on the flooring you're going back with, you want your 16 inch on center to be the right height. Let's just go through this. Different flooring options, different repairs, okay? Let's make a rule. If you're going back with carpet, fine, do this. You can set this here. We're gonna show you step one is laminating, screwing, and gluing. Um, if you're going with a floating floor, laminating, screwing, and gluing, you're fine. If you're gonna go with a tile job, now we have a brand new problem. 
Because if you're doing a tile job and you want to set this up in the bathroom, for instance, really common, people want to put the tile in the bathroom and then have it the same flush height as the hardwood in the bedroom, you're going with a three-quarter buildup. And in order to do that, you're going to want to put the Schluter Dietra membrane right on the OSB, okay? Which means if I laminate, my, my gap from floor joist to floor joist is too big for the Dietra membrane to maintain the integrity for that tile installation. If that's the case and that's you, then what you do is you just measure that. You take this board off, okay? Take it out to the table saw and you're going to run it, the table saw blade, on this side of that line so that when you're done you see the black line and you've got this thin little strip, okay? That thin little strip then you would install right on top of the floor joist. A little bit of construction adhesive and a couple of screws and then you put the OSB back on. Does that make any sense? Right? I think that should, it's, it's, it's a little bit more work but it maintains your 16 inch on center if you ever have a problem with a product and you did not install according to their plan you have no warranty you can't call them up and say your product failed because they're going to come and inspect and if they see that you did a laminated job and your gap is too wide they're going to say nah you made the mistake and by the way here's the bill for having us come out and visit you don't want to go there <laughs> all right so let's just make sure we do it right the first time and that'll do good for tile. For every other kind of flooring application, just laminating works great. So now I'm going to show you how to laminate a floor joist. All right, so construction adhesive, okay? This is the money right here, kids. We cut it. We pierce the seal on the, on the inside of the can. And there we go. Now, the way you laminate a floor joist is really kind of simple. You got two options. You can put the glue on, onto the, the piece you're laminating, or you can attach it directly to the floor joist. I'm going to suggest that putting glue on a floor joist sideways makes a heck of a mess, okay? It always falls through and drips down and makes it work with the gravity here, okay? And you don't need much, and you don't need to have a whole pile of this compound, just enough because you're going to make contact. Just a little bit of a snake here. Don't go too close to the edges so that when, you do, when you're done, it's not squeezing out all over the place and making a mess. All right, and watch this. It grows even after the pressure's off, okay? Always have somewhere to set that where it's not gonna end up on the floor or making a disaster. <sighs> That's just a mess waiting to happen. Now we're going back with the same technique with the flooring screws here, okay? Being mindful not to get that glue on you. That stuff does not come off easy. Now, bring it over to the wood open like that so there's no glue contact. Get the right depth and then roll it into place. Set your screws. All right, now, now you're gonna wanna get on the other side and you're gonna to wanna to set the glues, set that glue joint with a construction screw. Now this is a three inch screw, we have three inches of meat. So you're gonna to wanna to go on a bit of an angle, something like this, so you can bury the head. And you bury the head because the head is what creates the compression. Whenever you're using glue, compression makes that bond really strong. You want one of these screws every eight to 10 inches. Okay? And you don't want it coming out the other side. <laughs> All right, now, that makes a great laminated beam, so we are good to go. All right? Okay, now, if you are gonna go with tile and the Schluter membrane, or tile at all, let's just say, and you don't wanna have to pull it out, you don't have a table saw, and you're a homeowner, you got simple tools, here's a simple solution. Get a second two by four. Come at it and do the same thing from the other side, okay? Now you've created a gap that's less than what they their minimum requirement, and you pass the, the quality control for each floor joist cavity. You're not gonna run into an issue. That's all there is to it. Nice and simple. You can repair your own floor, eliminate squeaks for the rest of your life, and that is golden. Hey, it's Jeff from Home Renovision here. Today I'm here to tell you all about how to make a hole. Yeah, I know, exciting stuff, right? Truth is, it's incredibly good information to have if you're a home renovator. There's been a lot of innovation and a lot of change in the industry over the last little while. 
And so having the right information so you know how to buy the right tools uh, to get the right kind of result is really important. So we're going to go through a bunch of different stuff that's going on in the marketplace, teach you a bunch of tips and tricks to help you have the most successful renovation you can have in your own. Uh, I don't really know where to jump in and start on this, so I'm just going to let it all come out and we'll see where we end up, all right? Here's how this works. A long time ago, we decided we were going to start running mechanical in people's homes. And there was two kinds. There was uh, plumbing and there was heating and there was some electrical. Plumbing was basically minimized to uh, hot water radiators. And so they had to drill a hole about three quarters of an inch wide. And so they had the old hand corkscrew drill. And they literally used that to make these holes to run plumbing. Aside from that, they used the same kind of tool for electrical, right? So you'd have one guy on your crew 100 years ago and he spent his whole day going like this, augering out those holes It took forever. The HVAC guys didn't bother with any of that. They just took out saws and they just cut great big squares out of everything and made a mess of all of the floor choice package. Since then we've come a long way. So now we've got power tools, not hand tools. So we have the ability to uh, use a drill to make a hole in just about anything, anytime, anywhere, for any reason. And I wanted to just start off with, if you are a homeowner, there's two major tools to making holes. One is the impact driver, and one is the drill driver. Now, a lot of holes you can make with this impact driver, and if you're only going to have one drill, you can do almost all of the projects you're going to need with this one drill, because they make drill bit accessories with the quick connect tips. Okay, ready to go. Nothing to it. Now we have two different kinds of bits here. Obviously this is a titanium bit and this is a, a spade bit. That's what they call it. It has an auger fed system. Locks in place. And we have an auger bit. Okay, now this is a regular drill bit and this is uh, actually titanium. So while we're talking about that, I've got one other kind of drill bit for making a hole for drill bits. And that is a black oxide. Now when you're out buying and you're shopping around, the black oxide is a lot cheaper. Okay. The titanium will last up to five times longer. That's just the way it is. It's a much stronger composite, much stronger metal. Okay. Now, if you're not doing a lot of drilling and you just need the occasional hole, then this is a great little set to have. But if you're going to be in the trades, uh, definitely up your game. Okay. Now, the limitations with this, with drilling holes, is that uh, we move into a, the bigger the hole, the bigger the tool. Okay. For instance, here's a hole saw kit. All right. This type of hole saw requires a variable chuck. It doesn't have the quick connect. And so that's where this drill comes in. This drill has the ability to have a different chuck size so you can stick this kind of tool in and lock it in place. And then we're ready to go, okay? So the bigger the hole, the bigger the tool. Just keep that in mind. If you're only gonna buy one drill, you're probably not going to be able to drill holes for plumbing unless you have a drill driver. You can get away with electrical because they make spade bits up to inch and a half. And you don't need to have too many holes out there that are inch and a half for electrical. <laughs> Let me tell you. Now, we're going to use this mock-up here and we're going to demonstrate how to drill some holes. We're going to show you some tips and tricks in there as well. And because if you're going to be drilling holes and doing plumbing and electrical, then there are things you need to know as far as building code is concerned that could pass or fail your inspection. And it could also cause floods and fires if you do it wrong. So I want to make sure you do this right, okay? Let's deal with electrical. Electrical is a great place to start and then we'll move into all the plumbing that we're going to need, okay? So for electrical, I'm going to cheat and I'm going to use this one because we're going to simulate uh, somebody who's just making holes for their own wiring. And here we go, I've got a one inch hole. And now with electrical, what you understand is that we're going to pass the wire through the wall, okay? Now this wall here is three and a half inches, okay? Now the electrical code wants your wire passed an inch and a half from finished wall. So you all also get drywall. All right, so drywall is half an inch, and that means you got one inch here and one inch from there. You've got this great big space here that you can drill a wire, and you're gonna be just fine, all right? And the reason for that is that the, the building code has got everything down to a science, all right? And I know a lot of people don't understand it this way, but it does. 
Even the screw that you're using to attach your drywall, if it's a half inch thick drywall, you use an inch and a quarter screw. And it only goes so deep, okay? And so you're never gonna come in contact with your wire if you put it in the right place. So, what we do is we're gonna take the drill, and now either of these drills, if you use these uh, short bits, are gonna be able to fit inside the wall cavity. You don't have to drill in an angle, okay? Now, just for demonstration here, if you don't have a cavity that's 16 inches on center, and you use a long bit, you might not be able to get your tool in, but they do sell it in a shorter version, okay? So it'll help you in tighter spaces. Plus, the difference between the two drills, all right, this is a much more compact scenario. So it gives you a lot more versatility. So when I'm coming in to drill the hole, I can just go square in off this, set this in the middle of the stud, and then just drill. Hold the battery in case you hit something and it flings up in your face, okay? and just go at it. Done. Nice quick work. Now, there are more efficient ways to make holes, especially for electrical. And that is to use a regular drill bit and make sure it's square the tool. There we go. You'll see that this drills through a lot faster. Okay, you get the difference? Different tool, different design. This also fits in this drill. It's not as fast, all right? Just give an idea. Now, if you are caught in a spot where you don't have a lot of flexibility to get the drill in the area, you can use what we call this flexible extension, and this is gonna blow your mind. I can take my short bit, okay, and I can set it where I wanna put it, and I can stick this pipe on this crazy angle. Hold the extension. It's not sexy, but it'll get the job done. And the more, the more compressed the situation, the easier it is to make that work because it's not gonna be bouncing around, okay? The other thing you can do with this is you can run your plumbing. Now, we have a floor joist cavity here. And we're gonna do a demonstration where we're gonna run our plumbing. Uh, let's, do it, uh, let's do it this way. I'm gonna run my plumbing line from a floor joist. Now, I don't wanna go near the top, same thing. Subfloors get screws, so keep it down. Keep it a couple inches away. Now, in this scenario, I'm on an outside wall. And in a lot of places, you're gonna have problems with this. Or you could be on an inside wall and your floor joist is sitting there as well. So if I was to translate this information, floor joist is the first inch and a half. I can't drill in that part of the wood, all right? But what I do wanna do is I wanna drill down, but because it's PEX and we want it to bend up gradually, I wanna drill down on an angle, okay? So you can either set your drill, but you don't have much of an angle there, right? This is where this bit comes in really handy because I can set my drill hole way back here, get started. Now, I can do it this way. Get a really nice aggressive angle. All right. There, that's a great angle, wow. Clean out the burrs. Now, where is the end of my pipe? There it is. And here's another little tip for you. If you're gonna be renovating and using PEX, leave it in the rack. They come 50 and 100 foot roll, and you can take the pipe out from the inside, and then you can just release as much as you need. That keeps the rest of that pipe in that package. I know, blows your mind, right? 
as soon as you cut all that plastic away, it's going to become this four foot large roll. It's difficult to manage. This keeps it manageable. So now we got this pipe. Ah, you'll see it comes out of the package. It's all bent all over the place, but that's fine. Okay, we're going to come through the hole. So here we go. Now my PEX is coming up through the wall and it's already on the slope. So I don't have much of a bend to make. Okay, I'm not going to cause a kink in the line making that corner. The next is this. While we're talking about plumbing, we'll grab some plumbing pipe and we'll show you about your drain. Now, let's say we're going to put a drain over here. You can see my dilemma. I have this restriction from the wood underneath that I'm just talking about, right? Okay, so I need to get a nice big hole here. I have a couple of options. I can use a hole saw that's big enough that fits over the pipe so I can have a, a hole and I can use this kind of bit. And when it comes to these bits, there's two kinds. The kinds that are a little on the lower cost and they just tighten on, okay, that's all they do. They're just like a nut. And the problem with these is when this gets hot, it expands and overheats. You can't take that bit off for like a week, all right? You need two tools and some lubricant. This kind here has pins. And when the pins are out, it unthreads real easy. I'm gonna demonstrate right here. I'm gonna throw the pins in, and you can see the pins growing from behind the wheel. Ready? Okay. And you just line them up with the holes, and the pins can go in the hole. If you don't have enough room, you just tighten up a little bit, and then extend the pins into the holes. There we go, okay? This type is always gonna be able to be taken apart because you're just backing the pins out and you don't have everything seized on there really tight. So this is a better type, type of hole saw. Of course, you can go to the hardware store and you can buy something like this for about 30 bucks, okay? And you have one size will do almost all of your plumbing, okay? Most of the plumbing you're gonna be cutting holes for is gonna be just this two inch or one and a half. So just buy one hole saw for two inch hole and you'll be able to do most of the plumbing on your own. But if you're in the trades, I'm gonna recommend you just up your game and you get something like this. Now this has got great auger bits for running plumbing, PEX, but it also has these monsters here. It even comes with an extension, okay, if you need it. Now, this auger bit here is only available for this drill. Now it has a self-feeding screw system on the front and the whole side of that shaft is one blade, okay? This burns through wood like nobody's business. Let me just demonstrate here. Hold on. It'll soften up your power a little bit because it wants to eat in so bad it'll just bury itself before it gets there. If it stops working, I'll demonstrate here. Yeah, usually it gets covered up with wood on the inside the auger here. So what you do is you just go in reverse and clean that out. And then you can go again. Come on, Come on baby. Like most hole saws, when you get near the end, this uh, threaded tip here is no longer pulling it through. You have to start to push. Now look at this. That's a lot of debris. You're taking out a lot of wood. Now, these bits are more designed for the professional um, 90 degree angle hole saw. They actually make a tool that's just for that. It's a few hundred bucks, and so most homeowners are gonna go and put this right in their own drill like I'm showing you. I'm not gonna show you the other tool because it's not necessary. You can rent one if you want it. It doesn't kick and throw you around. But the point is, as long as you're anchoring yourself and you're holding that battery real tight, you should be okay.
Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's work. Now, the sharper this is, the better it works. Mine obviously is dull and needs to be sharpened. But I wanted to give you an idea of the kind of fight that you're in for when you do this. Ha! <sighs> okay. The other option for making a hole for doing plumbing, and this is kind of funny, but you ready? Let me just get this out of the way and I'll show you. This is just ridiculous. And then you take a sawzall, and you stick it in the hole, and you cut the other three sides. <laughs> now, if you're going to do something like that, you're going to have to consider using a plate either situation. Okay? If you can drill the hole, you're going to want to put something like this on. Oh, I need my damn hammer. Demonstrate that whenever you're working on your house, especially when you're working on your own house, and you run into a situation where you've got plumbing or electrical passing through the frame closer than an inch and a half, you get a plate and you put that on there. And the reason you put it there is because when you go to attach a wall, you know you have framing across the bottom. And then you know where your studs are because you're installing wall board. And so your screw line is down the studs and across the bottom. And you don't want to put a screw into your drain or in your water supply or into your electrical. So whenever you're in the wrong location and you don't have that gap left, can you imagine? You do your house, you get all the plumbing done, all the electrical done, you're ready to close, you close it up, you screw on your drywall, you don't have a plate, you put a screw right in the drain, okay? You don't know there's a problem. <laughs> you finish it, you put the kitchen cabinets in, you do all the tile work, the counters, then you find out you have a problem. Look at this location. Guess where that is? Just a couple inches below the toe kick on your cabinets at the back wall. The only way you can get in to fix that is to tear all of the cabinets and countertops out again. Yeah, it's a, it's a thousand dollar mistake or it's 10 cents. Okay, spend the money, protect your plumbing. All right, the other option you have is you have a big mess is you can buy one of these. Now this is a four and a half inch uh, cover plate for electrical box, all right? And you can, you can stick that there too, and just use a couple of screws and throw it in place. You can use these anywhere, so feel free. You always got an option in the electrical aisle to buy protective plates for your plumbing, okay? <laughs> I'm gonna show you the painful process for making a hole, because that was actually relatively easy. This is what a lot of people end up using. God help us all. This assembly actually fits in between the floor joist cavity. It's less than 15 inches. So I can still drill a hole through the side. I'm gonna find wood with no knots because it's already difficult enough. <laughs> That's a brand new bit pretty much, so we'll see how well it works. Well, pretty dangerous, huh? That's all right. That's okay because we're cheap and we're, we're invested. We wanna do this and we don't want it. Whoop, yep, you getting the idea here? Not the right tool for the job. <laughs> well, I'm not gonna come all the way through that hole. I'm gonna rip myself to shreds and I'm gonna need too much electrical tape. And I'm almost out, so. Uh, let's move on. Let's see what we got. So we showed you how to do plumbing, water supply, drain lines, electrical lines. The, uh, these bits here are actually, they're quite dangerous and they're somewhat cost effective, but you, you really gotta be using that right angle drill because that's the drill that doesn't have the same kind of torque as these drills, okay? It goes a lot slower and it won't jerk around on you if you make a mistake. Okay, big tools need big drills. This is another way to drill a hole. With this drill, you can drill a hole really quick. So let's drill a hole and we'll show you how well this one works. Done. Now, it comes an inch and a half, but that's the wrong dimension for the inch and a half pipe. Remember, inch and a half ABS is the interior dimension. This will not drill out the pipe, okay? So don't buy the wrong tool for the wrong job. Remember, inch and a half ABS requires about a two inch hole, okay? 
So when you're shopping, if you're going to buy a whole kit like this, you're going to be in the neighborhood of about $300, $400. This is definitely for the pro. Okay. What did I do there? But they are amazing. And I love them. All right, so we've shown that, we've shown that, we've shown that. We haven't shown this yet, have we? No. This has a quick connect and it's extender. This is for everyone who's vertically challenged. Like when I'm working with my kids. <laughs> Snaps in, okay? So now you can reach above your head. You don't need a ladder to drill through holes through the plate to run your wiring, okay? This works amazing too. Important when you're doing this, don't push too hard. Let the drill bit do the work. Pushing doesn't help, okay? You push too hard, it almost stops moving. All right, now you're into the attic. Piece of cake. That'll save your bacon, right? Just having the extender around. That gets you another 15, 16 inches, brilliant. <laughs> okay. Now, the next thing is this list of little titanium bits. You buy a kit like this, you get all kinds of things. Now, these smaller bits down here, they're generally used for pilot drills. Just preparing a hole. Like if you're gonna be screwing through hardwood or something like that, you can pilot a hole, okay? Or just pilot a hole through metal. If you're doing uh, shower door installations and you wanna just prepare the hole for the set screw that holds the door kit with the U-channel that's against the wall, this is brilliant because when it comes down to it, the way you find the right pilot hole is you take your screw and when you look at it, there's a the thick shaft in the middle and then there's the rings on the outside. And a good pilot hole is the same size as the thickness of the shaft. And you allow the rings to do all the grabbing and all the work. So if you're going into metal, there's something there to hold on to. If you're going into wood, it's got something to carve into. And I'll just go in front of the screw and if I can see the, the, the drill bit, is as wide as those screw rings. I'll just go down till I find one that's the right size. That's still too big. And I think, yeah, there we go. This is gonna be the perfect size. Now you can see it really clearly. When I hold it in front, I can still see the rings of the screw in behind it. So you can still see the, the, the thread of the screw extend past the width of that. That makes a good pilot hole, okay? So then you can just drill a hole. Okay, and the screw won't push into it, but you can almost screw it by hand or a screwdriver at that point, okay? Because you've pre-drilled a hole. Now that fastener, it's also not going anywhere. Okay. That was only two threads in, amazing, eh? So consider that when you're working with delicate finishing, okay? So not every time you drill a hole is gonna be during construction. Sometimes you need to have tricks to do finishing work as well. And pilot holes are worth money in the bank. I got one more little tip to show you. It's more like a trick. And this is a great little gizmo. This is from DeWalt. It's their new extender. It's like a right angle hole saw. But for smaller scenarios, okay? Um, I don't know when you might need this, but it has an attachment that is like a bit extension, clips together. All right, now it's quick connect, okay? Now look at this. I got a quick connect. I can drill a hole anywhere, right? Okay, so now if you're in an interesting spot, now I can drill a hole through here. Just use this like a pistol grip. Oh yeah. That actually worked pretty good. I like that. It's a great little tool. <laughs> All right. The other option, of course, is for really tight spaces. It just has a little release here and it turns. And then you can pop this collar back on. Bam, snaps in. Here we go. Quick connect. You also got this little lever here too. All right. That actually was a lot faster. I like that. You know, if you're doing decking work, and you know sometimes you gotta just get in there and put in a lag bolt and it's an inconvenient spot, this is a great way to get that perfect half inch hole for all of your, uh, your, your nuts and bolts. That's pretty cool. 
Fun. Now listen, this was only, uh, I think it was 20 bucks. That was a great investment. I'm gonna have to put that somewhere, make sure I don't lose it. Now remember, the bigger the hole, the bigger the tool, okay? But if you're a homeowner and you're just doing smaller projects, and you only want to own one drill, then you can get away with owning an impact driver and buy the quick connect bits to make holes all the way up to, I think we got up to an uh, inch and a half spade bit. Okay, that's on the market. That's about as big as you're going to get. And then you're going to have to upgrade. So if you want to run some PEX plumbing or if you want to run some wiring, this little bad boy here will do everything you need. If you want to get into moving your plumbing around, you're going to have to get to this big. One more thing. I just wanted to tell you a little secret. If you're going to start drilling holes with a hole saw like this or a three inch hole and you're trying to move plumbing with that big a hole in dimensional lumber, you got to be really careful here because dimensional lumber is not designed to have that big a hole drilled in it. You can't run four inch holes for exhaust ducts and stuff like that. You'll weaken the lumber and wreck your structure. Okay? So what we do is we would call up an engineer. This is a, okay, based on that size of a hole, I'm going to recommend that you drill the hole and then you take plywood with adhesive and structural screws and you cover that hole and then you drill it back from the other side again, okay? And then depending on the size of the hole and the load that's on that floor joist, if it's just foot traffic, you're fine with one, one layer of plywood, usually half inch, sometimes five eighths. But if it's a, a structural in the, for the house, it's holding up a, a wall, he'll have you do the other side as well and then you drill back through the other side and you glue and screw that side as well, okay? Now, they'll give you the dimensions for how long that run of plywood needs to be and all that sort of thing. Usually four feet is what they're working with. Just give you that little tip as an advance. You can move, put holes in plumbing, dimensional lumber, up to a two inch hole without having to worry about it. Okay, there's no code issue. But as soon as you get bigger than that, now you gotta get a structural engineer. If you have engineered floor joists, anything that's in that OSB area, so I have lumber on top, lumber on the bottom, OSB in the middle, Anything in that OSB area you can drill through and have added up to six inch hole. That's the best that I'm aware of. Now, if the code is different in your area, make sure you get in the comments section and let us know, okay? But generally speaking, that's about enough information for you to go and get all your electrical and all your plumbing rerun throughout your whole house. If you like this video and it helps you out, give us a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Hey, it's Jeff from Home Renovision here, and here we are, part five of our series. Now we're talking about flooring installation, different assemblies, how to get from one product to the next and get the best result. But before we do that, we wanna do a little demonstration here so you understand the concept of deflection. Now I'm not gonna do an in-depth tutorial today about how to install tile, but I'm gonna cover some of the basics so you have an idea of what's going on. Now, <clears throat> here we have our subfloor. Okay, it's 5 8 OSB. And in its current condition, now it's been um, we'll call it screwed down and glued down, okay? Because that is the way that we like it. Every eight inches, right? Just like the rest of the demonstration. And here we have 5 8 plywood. Now, if you add these two layers together, you get to an inch and a quarter. And that is the magic number for doing tile install direct onto plywood. You want good one side plywood because this bonds really well with the thin set and you don't want to have a second layer of OSB. OSB doesn't bond very well to thin sets, so you can't cheat and do that. So this year, we're gonna find that with a cast of plywood, it may not be that feasible, but in most cases, it actually makes a lot of sense. The other option is to use a cement board. Now this cement board here is a half an inch, and if you were to add that with a little bit of thin set, you end up with the same inch and a quorter. This is my recommendation for tile. I know right away there's a lot of tile guys out there that use quarter inch cement board when they're doing their, their installations. And they swear by it, they've been doing it for a lot of years. I don't use cement board where I am, we always go with plywood. So I don't have enough experience to really chime into that, except for me, the idea of a quarter inch cement board, you're really, really, really depending on the thin set application. There's a lot of, how do you call it, faith being put in the bond of that thin set to that OSB in order to get the strength. So, before we start, let's do a demonstration. Here's a floor joist cavity, okay? It's typical. There's nails or screws, and let me show you what happens when you step on it. Okay? That's just body weight. That's not, that's called deflection, okay? The floor moves. 
Now, I'm just gonna throw a few screws in here real quick. And we'll take a look at the difference in the deflection once we have them laminated together. Okay, now hopefully if that went well, you will have seen that this has a lot less deflection than the other side. Now, what we do here is then at this point we're going to be adding thin set and then our tile. So an approved tile installation, just so you know, is go back to your OSB, put in your subfloor, and we have a video for that. I'll put all the links to all the videos that are related to this in the description below. And then you add your thin set and lay your tile. Now, we're going to do a really in-depth tile installation video in the near future. So if you're interested in learning about how to lay tile, floors, walls, different sizes, wet rooms, concrete, plywood, all the different scenarios, then make sure that you um, subscribe to the channel right now and click the bell for notifications. Because when that video comes out, it's probably going to be about a two-hour tutorial on everything to do with installing tile. And it should make a lot of difference for a lot of people out there who've got to tackle these projects on your own. But between now and then, we got my little mock-up here and we're going to get a lot of the groundwork covered. Here's a very traditional tile nowadays. It's 12 by 24, all right? And you're going to see that all of that together becomes the thickness of your floor. Now, just for the sake of showing this, this is a piece of three quarter inch pine. It's the same thickness as regular solid wood hardwood, okay? And you're going to see that there's a difference in the height. And a lot of people are wondering, how do I install tile flush with hardwood? Do I have to build up this side? Do I have to install some plywood, a quarter inch or something? And the answer is you could, but there is another option. I'm not going to get into the option today. We're going to do that in the tile video. But there is an alternative from cement board and plywood that you can put directly on your OSB. And it's called Schluter Dietra. There's other membranes out there as well. And it gets laid in thin set, filled with thin set, and you can tile on top of it. And they actually finish flush. So we're not going to destroy, you know, demonstrate that today. But we are going to let you know that there is an option. So don't despair. Okay? You don't have to cover your whole house in plywood just to raise up the level to meet your tile. You can install your tile to the height of your hardwood. So right now we're going to go through a bunch of uh, accepted or approved installation techniques. Okay? So we already know tile. Tile is... Uh, 5 8 OSB, 5 8 plywood, or half inch cement board, or the Schluter Dietra membrane, and then your tile. That works in almost every situation as long as you've got a 2 by 10 construction on 16 inch on center floor joist. Okay? And that's a pretty good money in the bank scenario. At any time, if you're cheating on any one of those items, the spacing, the thickness of the joist, the thickness of your assembly, you're running the risk of having too much of that deflection we were talking about and breaking out the grout in between the tiles and possibly delaminating the tile from the cement. And that's just horrible. It's, it's just don't do that to yourself. You don't want to put everything in because don't forget tile we're putting in bathrooms and kitchens. And in those situations, if, you're, if your tile delaminates, the only way to fix that, if it cracks, is to replace it. So, key to the newbies, when you buy tile, buy extra in case you run into problems, okay? Because the last thing you want to do is have a bunch of cracked tile in your room and you can't find any more product inventory because they're always recycling and changing things in and out. It gets outdated really quick, okay? And you'll have a kitchen and next year you'll have cracked tile. Oh no, and you go back to the store, we don't sell that anymore. Well, all my kitchen cabinets and everything are installed on top of it. What am I going to do? And the answer is cry because now you've got to go start all over again. So don't do that to yourself. When you buy tile, buy extra. Don't be cheap. Don't measure off the room and pull out your, your design software and figure out, I need exactly 86 square feet. Buy 100. All right? Just have some extras lying around. Make your life a lot simpler. You won't have any stress. It's not about the install. It's about the repairs. What if? What if I didn't screw it right? What if there was a weak spot? Right? What if somebody drops something heavy and shatters a tile? Think about all these possibilities and have extra. Now, 
for the lack of uh, having any hardwood around, here's our hardwood. Now, if you're over top of a conditioned space, you don't need any paper. But if you are on a crawl space, then there's definitely going to be a need for a, a, uh, a felt paper. Okay? Um, you check your different regions around the world, but everybody has a different requirement. It might even uh, have a vapor barrier attached to it. And you install that over top of it, and it gets nailed, and that gets attached to the floor. Tile attached to the floor. You might even have something called engineered hardwood, which is a lot like this product, only a little thicker, and it gets attached to the floor. And that's usually about a half an inch to five eighths thick, not as much as three quarters. Then we move into laminate, good old fashioned MDF laminate. I recommend installed on a three millimeter EVA subflooring. It's a quiet pad. Okay, this stuff here has a foil back, it's a vapor barrier. And this absorbs sound and gets rid of impact noise. Now this particular flooring I bought from Home Depot already has it attached, so you don't need to have it underneath it. But if it doesn't have it attached, you need to use the pad. The next kind of flooring is a floating hardwood, engineered hardwood, okay? This is brilliant. Again, this is floating. We have attached products and we have floating products, all right? The floating product goes on an underpad for the same reason, click locks together. And then we have the vinyl products, same thing. It's a floating floor. Click locks together, goes on an underpad. In every situation that you're installing a floating floor, you want the underpad, okay? Let's stop the argument right now. Home Depot came out with a product and they said, don't use an underpad with it. And they had that on the market for a couple years until they changed their mind and said, we need to start using an underpad. So when people tell you you don't need an underpad with a floating floor, just tell them, no, Jeff says I need an underpad and get one, all right? You're always gonna need an underpad. This absorbs impact noise, okay? Maybe we'll just do a quick test right now and see if I know what I'm talking about. Huh? Do you hear that? It's a lot noisier. Rule number one when you're doing a flooring job, and, and i be honest with you, I don't expect all of you to do your whole house at once, okay? So having that in mind, since you're gonna be doing room at a time in a lot of cases, rule number one is take everything back down, right back to the OSB, okay? This is, your, this is your start. This is your canvas for your new work of art that you're gonna to put together. Until you got back down to the OSB, you're lying to yourself about what you're doing. You're putting product over product over product, okay? And here's what happens. You're creating such an unusual thickness in the floor that no one has engineered a product to help you transition from one room to the next. Every one of these products here have got products designed to transition from one to the next because they were manufactured with transition pieces. Okay, so here's the deal. First transition, let's, let's talk about going from tile. First of all, tile. If we are going to hardwood floor, we have a transition piece for that. Okay, done. All right, and these metal trims are sold and they're designed to be installed underneath the tile. So you get flush and it comes down and it caps the wood. So even if your bathroom has got a bit of a gap at the door, you can transition that gap onto the hardwood. Okay, that's a nice clean look. The next product, why not? We'll just go through the whole run. All right, here we are now. A nice thick laminate in your hallway. There's a product here for you. Again, does the transition, and it has extra support here so that you can get that over top of your flooring and you can put your tile afterwards, okay? Now the danger here, and I'll be honest with you, is that this is what we call a temporary floor. This is exposed to last 50 years. Because they're floating, we only expect 25 out of them. So at some point, you're gonna to wanna to remove that floor and then install another floor right underneath. And it may be tricky, okay? So having something in the cement like that is not beneficial. They do make this. Here's the transition. It's adjustable. Look at this. This ramp is always moving, so you can actually lock your floor in underneath it forever and ever and ever. And that gives you all the flexibility in the world to make adjustments over time. So you can put your tile floor in today, do your bathroom, the rest of your house looks like junk. That's okay because you've got a transition here that works. And then when you are ready for your flooring, you can set it in and drop it down. 
Yeah, perfect every time, right, Max? <laughs> now you'll see that these transitions, they come in a variety of different profiles and they're made so that they can adapt. You can get them like this, okay? So that when you use that Schluter Dietra, it, the metal comes the same height as the wood, as the tile. All these different options are on the marketplace. So the, the secret to success with flooring is knowing that as long as you're using an approved assembly, you're going to have trim options to go from one kind of material to the next. Here's another option that you have on your repertoire. So let's assume that this is a bathroom, this is a hallway, and the door is right here, and this is the threshold, the transition, okay? And you've got a carpet in the hallway, and you want a tile. Well, you've got options, oddly enough. We have this transition right here. Check this out, okay? It, it actually sits over top the edge of the tile, of the carpet, sorry. And the tile will actually sit on top of it. Now, don't get worked up with the color because they come in a lot of different colors. And when you install it dry, it should be a little taller because don't forget we're adding thin set underneath. Okay, that gets a nice clean look, all right? Here's another option you have. Again, okay? Not a problem, and the day comes, you change the carpet out, the carpet installer comes back, and he's, he's right back in business again. All right? Here's another option. This is a little more retro, and you can get these marble sills in four and six inch, but sometimes your bathroom is an odd shape. You can get this, you can plywood right up to the edge. Leave about a quarter of an inch overhang, all right? So that when you put your under pad there, you can throw your carpet in, now it can be tucked just underneath. That's a perfect assembly. You tile up next to it. Now what you get over here is you got a ridge, right? This becomes a waterproofing system. You can put this in your bathroom so that if you get an overflow on your toilet or your tub, it'll actually hold water and you can put baseboard tile on as a baseboard and you can grout it and put silicone on the joints. You can make your bathroom waterproof. I know, and we used to do this all the time. More and more and more you're gonna find that uh, options for flooring are changing because it's all about design aesthetics. Everybody wants a nice flush floor. I don't know if they're all anticipating, you know, getting older and using walkers or what it is, but it seems like everybody wants a nice flush floor nowadays. It's a very sexy look. Just remember, modern materials require modern subfloors. So remember the key to a good installation is your assembly. And the assembly is not what you do from the OSB up. Your assembly includes your floor joists, the thickness, the spacing, the condition, the span, right? A two by 10 floor joist shouldn't be any longer than 16 feet from support to support. There are a lot of houses out there that are built substandard to that. And you can't just go jump in with modern materials and expect an older house to perform well. If you have two by eight floor joists, you don't have a strong enough floor to start tiling. I'm telling you right now. So resist the temptation to go do tiling projects on half inch OSB or two by eight structure or 24 inch on center or you know, something on an 18 or 20 foot span. It's going to fail. All right. You, you just, there's no way that you can save that assembly. It all comes down to this two by 10, 16 inch on center, less than 16 foot span. Okay, 5 eighths, 5 eighths OSB in good solid condition, right? Can't just have old moldy, rotten, fire rated, damaged product and say it's still there, it's fine. That's not common sense. Make sure it's all screwed and glued, just like in the video. If you're gonna start doing a tile assemblies, you can't fuss around. Back in the 1960s, they invented Thinset. And for the last, I don't know what, 60 years, maybe 50. For the last 10 years, we've had it figured out. But for 50 years following that, the industry has been going through a cycle of experimentation with the floor assemblies, okay? There's a lot of guys out there who are still doing things wrong because they learned how to do it from somebody who didn't know how to do it 20 or 30 years ago. Don't become a victim. The larger the tile, the less room you have for deflection and for making a mistake, all right? Older floors had little tiles. You can, you can bend that and deflect it all you want, no problem. But the bigger the floor, the bigger the tile, the less margin of error you have. So make sure you do it right. I don't wanna stress that enough because there's nothing worse than going through all that trouble, putting down a beautiful, perfect flat floor, right? 
getting the grout work done, started to enjoy your space, and then <laughs> and the four fails within a few weeks. That's a maddening experience. I don't want you to have that. Now, in this video series, at the very beginning, we showed you how to open your subfloor. I think if you're ever going to do a tile job, one of the rules you have to do is open the subfloor. You need to know what you don't know, okay? Is your floor two by 10 or is it two by eight with strapping and then drywall and it looks like it's a two by 10? You just don't know until you take a look. It only takes a few minutes to cut a hole and inspect, make sure everything is good, right? You can patch it. We've got the videos in the series here to how to do that. Make sure before you move forward, you go backwards in time and make sure that your older houses are brought up to a modern standard. Screws and glue is the best, but if it screws only, it'll work still as long as you've got the right dimensional lumber and everything else. I'm not trying to scare you, I'm just trying to educate you, all right? It took the industry 50 years to figure out how to do this right, so don't think on your first or second try you're gonna experiment and get lucky. It won't happen, <laughs> all right? Now, as far as all the other floating floors are concerned, knock yourself out, but don't install them until you at least go by and screw down your subfloor if you don't have it screwed down yet, okay? because deflection will still happen, you're going to get the squeaks in the, in, the, in the OSB with the nails, and then your brand new floor is going to make noise and people are going to be like, what's with your new floor, dude? All right, don't let that happen either, okay? One step at a time, here's the rules. Make sure you take everything back to OSB. Don't do layer on layer, all right? That's a guaranteed recipe for disaster. Open your OSB, know what you're dealing with. Make sure it's always screwed, okay? Even if you're just putting a floating floor, what does it take? A box of screws in an hour? You can screw your whole floor down and avoid any squeaks in the future. If you have dimensional lumber and your floors have got too much movement, make sure you open your subfloor, right? Fill the gaps if they're bowed and if they're humped, then shave them down, okay? And if you shave too much off, laminate a little plywood on the side. You got to make sure that your structure is flat. Materials like this, look at this. If I start installing flooring like this to follow a bend, okay, and it comes back out, I'm actually forcing gaps to happen in between the material because the distance on the short side of the curve versus the long side of that curve, it's longer here. The material isn't going to stretch to fill that gap. You've got to have it flat, okay? Make sure you take time to make your floors flat. A lot of these products that we're selling on the market today are actually designed to be installed on today's modern construction. Engineered floor joists, all right? And those floor joists are designed to be perfectly straight, perfectly level. They're never going to warp or bend or move. And so that's why all these new modern big materials work so well. If you have an older house, you've got to bring it up to par so that it's ready for installation with newer materials. If you don't want to do that, then stick to hardwood. Nail down tongue and groove hardwood in an old house all day long. No problem at all, okay? All right, that wasn't that painful, was it? And trust me, go grab yourself a roll of electrical tape. You're probably gonna need it if you're doing work like this. <laughs> now, cheers, listen, uh, if this was great, I know you've asked you to do this already, but do it again. Give it a thumbs up if you forgot. All right, well, listen, guys, if you enjoyed this video, you're gonna watch some more because all you're gonna do in your life is get back to subfloor with this sucker. So you're gonna wanna watch this video up here, learn how to install all your finished flooring so that you can make your house look like you paid someone to do it and make a lot of money while you're doing it. Cheers till next time.